Hello, hello, and welcome to my submission for this year's Anime Speedrun Festival 2024. My name is Kinru, and today I will be speedrunning at Ruby Grow Eclipse. Now, before we actually dive deep into it, firstly, there's something I need to actually do. So, now just for a little bit of context, uh, Ruby Grow Eclipse. It's basically just your typical hack and slash game. It's got light attacks, heavy attacks that follow the light attacks, heavy attacks on their own, that kind of thing. And there's even a counter button to counter enemies when they go to attack you, which does nothing if you actually don't counter anything. Now it's your typical game where you use WASD for movement and left and right click is actually your attack buttons. And there is a shoot button bound to R as well as an ultimate button on Q. But we're not going to play the game like that. We're going to play a little bit different. So what I need to do first is first configure these keybinds. And those are my keybinds. Now, we're going to start from scratch. Now there's a little bit of context laid as foundation. We can begin. Right. So we've done the key binds. Now I'll explain things as we go along, but for now let's just kick this off. So Ruby Grim Eclipse, all characters, no skips in three, two, one, go. Now, <laughs> first thing I suppose I should explain is the uh, tech I'm doing here. It is known as counter canceling. Now the, ca the counter button that I showed off before actually has a weird function when using an air attack so after you use an air ability you can actually press the counter button and it will make your character drop to the ground quicker than you usually otherwise should be able to. Now this was discovered upon the game's development but it was left in by the developers afterwards because I suppose you know what's the harm right in just leaving something like that in despite how utterly broken it is. <laughs> so what I'm actually doing is optimised movement which is known as bunny hopping and basically the fastest way you should be able to move in the game is jumping and dashing but because I'm allowed to counter after an air attack to drop to the ground faster I can basically gain the benefit of the jump dash and then I can just chain it right into another one and that's going to give me faster momentum and even though it may not seem like it because your character isn't really shooting across the screen you can kind of determine it by the terrain shooting past you it's a pretty good indication so now there are sort of diminishing returns so me doing it like this actually has no use at all it's just for fun I do it because I'm an idiot basically I just have an affinity for, well, I'll just say I'm a b-hop addict, it's just really fun to do. Now admittedly, I'm not overly conditioned, let's say, to commentating as while playing this game, so inherently I am going to be making mistakes compared to usual because I don't have my full focus to the game, but... I mean, that's totally cool because we're just here for fun, right? So it doesn't really matter as long as you get the job done. What I'm also going to be doing is setting my estimate a bit higher than usual because that way I think it's going to be... It's just going to allow me to show off a few more combat techniques which, not, which aren't necessarily the most optimal but it'll just give some variation in what I'm actually doing rather than just like the same old attacks over and over again which can get a bit samey. So, but yeah, you can use counter cancels for movement but you can also use it for combat. So for Ruby, her triple light heavy has a little backflip at the end of it. So what I'm doing after each one is actually pressing the counter button and that is allowing me to counter that backflip so I can land it instantly and start chaining another triple light heavy basically into each other and it's just optimized combat basically and it's basically her bread and butter move there's not really any other ability you would really want to use on ruby except in very specific conditions like her double light heavy is pretty good but for the most part you're just going to want to just use her triple light heavy because it's just that good so and that's chapter one so 
They are also able to counter cancel bullet shots. So generally with characters, you'll be jumping in the air, shooting, and then countering afterwards so you can land faster and do it again. And that comes out faster than just shooting, but you can also do it for individual bullet shots, which is also pretty fun. But it varies between characters, so the timings are going to be a little bit different. And a good point of that will be the next character we're going to be playing, which is Weiss. So... But something I didn't actually mention is, with bunny hopping, it is the most optimal way to move, but I'm actually doing a slightly more advanced version of them, which is... has no official term, but I call them dash bunny hops. So basically your dodge slash sprint button, if you hold it down before jumping, it actually gives you more height and distance off that jump. So by incorporating that into bunny hops, I'm using it as like an extra layer to gain like a bit more momentum compared to just jumping by itself. So by chaining that together, I'm gaining basically more momentum than just regular bunny hopping. And it is the most optimal way to move, unless there's like very specific tech. Which I did demonstrate in chapter 1 with Ruby going down some ledges, but it was pretty short-lived and I was already explaining something else, unfortunately. <laughs> but Now, something that is very important to mention on this section in particular, all these pots and crates that are around me here, they have the same hitbox as the enemies do. So what can actually happen, like there, is so <laughs> sometimes Weiss will want to... Yeah, she'll want to shoot the crates that are off in the distance, which, again, happen there. So rather than defeating the enemy as I'm shooting it off screen, she'll just aim for a pot over in the distance for no particular reason. And it's, it can get a little bit frustrating, but, you know, you just kind of learn to live with it. You can kind of help it by keeping things right in front of you, but when you're, like, in the heat of the moment, as I usually am, it can be hard to do that quick turn and really do it. Like, I kind of failed there as well. Pretty good example of talking and playing here, but it's, it's, it's fine. Just get a bit more alt, and then the last enemy. Now, there's obviously like optimal kill strategies for each enemy in the game, but we're not always going to be going for those because, again, I kind of want to like vary this up. So, like for example, here I'm just going to team attack this guy because I know that would spawn because he will live on like the tiniest bit of HP. I suppose it's actually a good idea to um, explain what team attacks are. But just a quick demo, that is the tap shooting on Weiss, which is the single bullet shots that I'm just countering over and over again. But team attacks in this game, they're basically the best stun you can get. There's, there's just no better. So there's regular stuns, but as you attack enemies during that, they can actually break out and hit you back. So it's not really a true stun per se. Whereas team attacks, they'll just keep it stunned until the timer runs out or you just kill the enemy. It won't break under any other condition. So it's like the best stun you can get. And it lasts a lot longer than the other stun does. Being a bit slow here, but it's all good. So, final fights like this basically comprise of optimal kill patterns. Just, I know where all the spawn locations are, so I'm trying to have it spawn in an optimal way. So that when one pack of enemies is defeated, I can move on to the next. That's, that's pretty much how it works. But then you get waves like this, where it's more optimal to just gather them all up. And then I can just deal with them all at once, so that's that wave done. And now this is the final wave, which shouldn't take too long. Okay, that's that. So 
do with that. But yeah, each character kind of has its own flair, so... For example, Weiss, mostly you're just going for her ranged attack and her ultimate. That's pretty much the main thing you're doing. And for some reason, the text at the end of this lasts like 10 years, so we just have to sit here for like 40 seconds or so, just while Port just rambles onto himself. So I usually just take the time to spam bunny hops between it, because again, I'm just a total idiot and I just find it fun. Now, this is an example of tech ledge. Ledge tech, I should say, where you can stand against the ledge and fling yourself across it. That is specific to Weiss, what I just did in that particular case, but Ruby's ones, you can basically do it with Altanol and just fly across the map. So Ruby's more like grounded focus, Weiss is more like ranged focused. Now we're going to play Yang, and Yang is arguably the highest APM character that you can actually play with this kind of style, so reason being her aerial heavy is a hard downward swipe and it's a single hit so with that in mind if you can just spam that over and over again your dps is going to be absolutely insane compared to just her regular attacks and it is her best attack if you can do it at a fast level so in that sense the game unintentionally rewards fast input speed which I find absolutely beautiful, like, it's just so fun to spam buttons in this game. So, you can deal with enemies pretty fast. Now, usually, creeps are, like, considered the easier waves, which are those really kind of small, stumpy, two-legged creatures we keep fighting. Those are creeps. They're meant to be considered the easier waves, but when you start getting better at the game and you start demolishing even the bigger Grim, like, pretty fast, they actually become one of the more annoying waves to deal with because the game compensates, like, oh, they're easy enemies, so we'll just give you, like, more of them. But that doesn't really work in your favour because now you just have to deal with more enemies, whereas if you had, like, four to deal with, it wouldn't be as tedious. And waves in this game, they are totally RNG based besides chapters one and two. So now we're pretty much hitting the first section of RNG that you're going to encounter in the game. And from here on out, it is purely going to be RNG based. There's, you know, there's not really much you can do about it. So when you go for no skips competitively, you are very, very limited by the RNG. waiting for him to spawn, counter, and that's that, okay. Like I said though, there are diminishing returns when it comes to bunny hopping. It's a little bit of a shame, because realistically I would just love to spam buttons and have it be successful all the time. But anyway, the fun's about to begin. Now what I'm doing here is Apart from failing, I'm basically condensing down the counter cancelling of the aerial heavy into smaller segments. And it's a lot easier to do two handed, but it's only really good against Ursas because they have no knockback. Anything else I hit with that aerial heavy is going to get knocked away from me. But an Ursa will just stay put, so I can just wail on it the whole time and it doesn't really matter. And because all my movement is bound to my mouse, that is pretty ideal considering when I take my hand off it I literally cannot move. So I'm just going to intentionally take damage here and get some ult back. A lot of this game though, even though yes high, PA, high APM is rewarding, you still need to kind of learn the timings because, for example, Yang, her aerial heavy will only go off when you can actually see that downward strike like that, that little downward. If I counter it too early, nothing happens. 
I, I would literally be doing no attack at all. So you, you need to kind of leave enough time for the ability to come out. And it's just something that you practice and you get better at. There's just not really any other way to go about it. Now we're dealing with verses again. But I'm kind of cheesing the timing when I go two-handed like this. Because what I'm actually doing is raising my index finger higher than I really should. And what that's going to do is it's going to artificially insert that gap that I need for me. And I was waiting for this attack. Whoopsie. That's all good. Let's just not get down by the first mini boss because that wouldn't be good. Okay, we'll just avoid that. And that was chapter three, and that's Yang. So. Very, very fun. Very fun. Just to spam buttons on her. It, again, it takes a little bit of practice to get the timing because when you first kind of see other people do it, like this whole style I didn't invent. I learnt it from a Japanese runner known as Alterna who played on Xbox controller. And I looked at him play and I was like, wow, this guy is insane. He's so quick. But the trouble is, he played on Xbox controller and I'm mouse and keyboard and I wanted to spam buttons but WASD doesn't really let you do that so instead I had to kind of formulate my own setup in order to play like him because I just wanted to spam buttons and you know go absolutely bonkers so after a long time it took a lot of trial and error but I eventually formulated these keybinds, which I still don't think I've actually properly explained yet. So, because there are four buttons to actually bunny hop, and you have, conveniently, four fingers, I realised that everyone has this natural ability to, like, tap their fingers along a table, like when you're waiting for something. So, with that in mind, we're going to use that to just spam over and over again in a row, and I have no ultimate, <laughs> but we're going to be spamming that in a row to keep bunny hopping one after the other. But again, it can only carry you so far because there's timings and such. So just because you have good APM doesn't inherently mean that you're going to do well. There's still like a lot of tech, a lot of knowledge you need to accumulate as well. And originally I thought if you have high APM you're just going to like demolish the game right. You know, it's like, oh I've got the APM now, I've got that down. But without game knowledge it can only take you so far. But now, I haven't really explained why we picked Weiss again. So we picked her because Weiss has the fastest movement speed out of all the characters. And this level is literally just an auto-scroller. There, there were two fights that we just did, and now I'm just delivering dust to this machine until the end of the level. And you cannot make it go any faster, so it is literally just an auto-scroll level that you just have to wait for. There's a little bit of strat you can do with this, so dust can only appear at one terminal. And I know there's three in this room, so now that one's been used, it can only appear in the other two. But if we're fast enough, we can actually get a double spawn whilst in this section. It doesn't matter if we don't, but you can just get that. It doesn't overly matter either that Weiss is the fastest character, because it's an auto-scroller. You're not going to go any faster, but it just makes it a little less tedious on the hands. And I'm going the wrong way because I know the last one's going to spawn over here. I'm sure you've probably noticed as well, but every now and again I will just do an input error. My keyboard actually does have an issue as well where it does double input sometimes, so I'm sure every now and again I do get caught out with that by it double countering. We didn't get the double spawn either, but it's all good. But I think for the most part it is just going to be me dropping inputs because that's just the nature of spamming keys. 
But I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest. If it means I can spam buttons, then all good. So, I'm just going to ignore all the enemies, there's no need to fight them. I was going to wait until it got to the next section, which would guarantee for the last bit of dust to spawn up ahead at the terminal. But honestly, it doesn't actually matter. It, it, like, you're just delivering dust anyway. So, as long as you're quick about doing it, it doesn't really matter the order you do it in. But this will be the last dust, and now we just wait for the end of the level. So, that was pretty much chapter 4, so that is exactly why I didn't pick another character, because you're just delivering dust, it's a total waste otherwise, so we just use Weiss again, make it a little bit easier on ourselves, but for now we're just going to go into completely fresh characters, now that level's done and dusted. The only issue with this game is that there's like 10 billion things to explain, and, and we're going through characters quite fast as well, like four minutes isn't really long enough to explain really what a character can do and the intricacies of it. And there's also game tech that I'm wanting to explain, so... But, I'm still going to be trying my best as we go along. But now we're going to go on to the cat girl of the show, which is Blake who has her own unique style as well, because again, all characters have their own way of playing. There's quite a few combos you can do on Blake, and of course there's going to be optimal ones, but we're going to be just basically exploring all of them. Blake also has a really good tap shoot, because her bullet more or less comes out on the same frame, like on the first frame. So with that in mind, you can just spam it pretty much to your heart's content and she'll just ricochet bullets all over the map. Funny as it may seem as well, but with my dash bunny hopping, it actually can become quite straining on the fingers after some time. Not always. It depends on a few factors, like if it's cold outside. But if I'm just a spam like this, even though I go slower, it does give my fingers a temporary break from just alternating. Since for dash bunny hops, I'm basically holding down the sprint button with my ring finger, and then I'm pressing my pinky finger on jump, letting go of dash, then pressing it and keeping it hold, held down again, and then doing my attack and counter. Also, yes, corners are overpowered in this game, so if you have no ults, you can just group everything up to a corner, and it's all good. Encounter that, and that's that done. What are we getting now? Okay, because there's a gap here, I know that an alpha creep's about to spawn, and some alpha creeps in this game are programmed to spawn after like a 12 second delay which is totally pointless, but that's what they programmed. I'm just going to see how this Ursa behaves. Sometimes they're really stubborn and they don't actually use their rock attack like I wanted them to. Now this section in the game is renowned for being very, very RNG heavy. And I think I've gotten pretty much one of the worst waves you can get on this section. And we'll just dodge that because I heard him. And that's that section done. But you can have that last a lot longer. But also a lot shorter. <laughs> so, it's all good. But we're heading towards the second to last area of the mission now. But more or less on Blake, what I'm wanting to do is damage things with her aerial heavy, and then you don't actually need to do that, you can just poke them as well, which also gets the job done. 
Her team attack is also very, very good. So it can... And it's also fast. So you can use it to finish off enemies. I'm just seeing if that thing's going to... There he is. Okay. I was waiting for that because that can be pretty detrimental to your health to say the least. <laughs> yeah, those mutated creeps, they can burrow underground. Now, they're the weakest enemy in the game, but it's their explosion upon death that really does the damage to you. And if you're not prepared for it, and you're not really aware of them, they can just... If you've already taken damage, they can just one-shot you. So just dealing with those. Counter him. And again, like some of these kill combos, they aren't really optimised or anything, but it's just to kind of do something a bit different. There's a bit of a mistake there, but it should be okay. Okay, good. The other thing that's important besides combat is actually just map awareness and like what things are doing around you. Also looking at your minimap is very helpful so you actually know where the enemies are. So my eyes generally are flickering around the map. I'm checking my minimap, I'm looking around me to what things are doing and I'm looking at my alt gauge. Because alt management in this game is also very, very important. But again, this is kind of where game knowledge can tie in as well. So if you know what you're going to be going up against in any particular wave... Let's just do this really quick. I am failing it, unfortunately. But there's a little trick here I want to do. Just a little combat trick. There we go. Okay, so against mutated Beowulfs, you want to shoot them to stun them, and then characters will use a charged heavy attack on them, and then usually you shoot them again and they use another charged heavy, but on Blake, when you shoot them and use her charged heavy, it just instantly breaks the stun. So what I'm doing there is using her triple light heavy, which leaves a clone, I'm countering the backflip, shooting it to stun, and then I'll use an uncharged heavy as the clone explodes and knocks it back. And then I'll use a charged heavy at the end. So because they can only take three hits before the stun breaks, that is all the three hits. The clone explosion, the uncharged heavy, and the charged heavy. With just inserting the bullet shot in there as well to instigate the stun. Now we're playing Pyrrha, so on Pyrrha, she's, I would say, pretty straightforward. She basically just wants to ult everything. Her bread and butter move is arguably her charged heavy, and it is, but I find myself barely using it in a way, because it seems to be a lot better just to use her uncharged heavy to gather ults, because it hits three times. Usually you wouldn't want to do it individually like this. But as an example, I can do it once on each enemy. And then when one goes to attack me, counter them, which will ricochet, and then use an ult. And that will just take care of them, rather than individually going to each one and just using her charged heavy. I mean, I suppose it kind of depends what you want to do, but I like keeping my ults quite healthy. Because ults on Pyrrha are just ridiculous. Against Ursas and things like that, she just obliterates them. It's not quite a one-shot, but it's close to it. So we're just looking for a key now to move on to the next area. And funnily enough, in this level, you can actually cheese it, which even casual players don't really have a trouble finding out. There's a ledge up there, which is where I'm about to head for this last section, but in that room we just were, you can literally just 
jump up to that ledge and grab the key to move on to the final sector. It, you really don't need to do all this. Let's take care of both of those. Okay. Now I do want to make sure that I'm going in to the final area with some healthy ults. Two is fine, because I was over capping there anyway. That is one of like the biggest sins in no skip speedrunning is over capping ults, basically on any character. If you're going to be over capping ults, you may as well have used it in a particular section, generally speaking, and dealt with the enemies faster. I didn't mean to counter there, but it's all good. So we're basically just at the final section again, dealing with the enemies, and then we can move on to chapter 7. So, again, it's all RNG dependent. I have no idea which waves are going to spawn, but I have knowledge about each wave that will spawn. So I kind of know how to react when I see the number appear, because that's pretty much an indication of what I need to do, looking at how many enemies are left. Deal with him, and there's the alpha. Okay, and that's that done. So what we're we getting here too. Okay, and that's the Ursa done. And that's that done. Okay, like Pyrazol is just absolutely absurdly overpowered. Cancelled that a little bit early, cancelled rather, but all good. So that was chapter six. So, you know, we're over halfway done now. I may need you to get a closer look to see what kind of cargo they're carrying, but be careful not to be spotted. Now, this next character we're going to play, undoubtedly, is the best in the game. She is by far the best character, and the reason being is that she has a, a damage buff built into her kit, which is just absurdly broken. Damage buffs in this game are just ridiculous. So basically, if you have a damage buff, you are just going to inherently outperform everyone else. So she becomes the strongest character in the game. Now, the condition to activate the damage buff you need to land five consecutive attacks against something. But she has a lot of multi-hitting attacks, so that condition isn't hard to meet. I've already hit it, as you can see from the lightning around me. And for anyone who's ever played this game, they know how annoying those androids are. But when you're Nora, you can literally just deal with them as they spawn in, and they just can't even attack you back. Kind of the same for these guys. It's just pretty much irrelevant. With other characters though, it doesn't matter if they spawn in because there are just ways to deal with them. Every character has their own specific tech in order to deal with stuff. And that's that. Now it's funny because if you're doing any percent, pretty much like 90% of the fights are actually able to skip over, probably even more than that actually. There's a thing you can do as well called wrong warping, where if you avoid a checkpoint of one of the off part of the mission, and then you hit that checkpoint after completing the mission, the game will think you're on the check that checkpoint of the next mission you're about to do. So if I hit the second to last checkpoint of this mission, after completing it, I will then be put at the second to last checkpoint of the next mission, as long as they have the same number of checkpoints. It can get a little bit confusing, but some fights you don't necessarily have to physically skip over is what I'm trying to say. You can just press play and you're at the end of the mission already, which is cool and everything, but I think would get perhaps a little bit samey, because without any kind of context. Just going to deal with these again. 
Okay, one, two, three, and that. Sonora actually has a funny little bit of tech where she has an ability in her talent tree because all characters have, have skill trees. But there's an ability that gives her chained lightning on all of her basic attacks. But for some reason, this reduces the time between her attacks. So I shouldn't be able to do it, but you can actually spam her dash light attack. And it has some pretty good DPS. Also, you can just hop up there and grab that relic. Because why go around? You're meant to really go around and jump up. So what I'm doing here now, I'm waiting for Merlo to say important. When he does... Okay, I'll shoot these because conveniently there's five crates. So I can get my damage buff active before the, the round even starts. Which is always very nice. Now her dash light attack it is very good, but it's pretty much the same DPS as her aerial heavy attack, which has a little hop at the end, which is what I'm countering afterwards. But I like using her dash light attack because it's really just personal preference what you really want to be using. One, two, three. And then there'll be an Ursa, which we can just demolish. And that's that, okay. It's a little bit hard to explain all the different kill strategies, but just know for Nora in particular that she just demolishes stuff as they spawn in. So it's not really a fight so much as it is just a slaughter. Just listening out for the dialogue so I know when the next wave is actually going to spawn in. Just going to be spamming that dash light. One, two, three, heavy. One, two, three, heavy. And this is the last one, so let's just deal with that. And that was chapter seven. Now, even though I'm playing no skips, it's actually not no skips, which is my forte. It's actually any percent. I'm the any percent record holder for a few categories, but combat is just extremely, extremely fun. So that's pretty much what I fell in love with initially. But if you want to learn all the tips and tricks and the skips and such, it's really just the case because there's very little information for the game of just asking around. So I, when I first came to this game to speedrun it, I was just asking all the top runners, like, how do you do this? I saw you do this. Can you explain to me in layman's terms how you actually went about that? And people in this community are very, very friendly. Like, they're all ready and willing to help you out, regardless. And the community isn't overly that large, which is a little bit unfortunate, but... We're always welcoming, welcoming to new runners. For Ren, I'm basically just using his aerial heavy here to gather the enemies up. And then I can just use a charged heavy at the end because he has an, a talent to make it an AoE. And it drains his health to use by 50%, but it hits very hard. So by gathering those Beowulfs up, I can just use that after, and it deals with them. And androids are basically just fodder due to his ult. Funnily enough, you actually cannot use his aerial heavy to counter cancer with for bunny hopping because he gains no momentum. Just going to deal with this real quick. And that was that. Now I have no idea what the APM counter is looking like, but 
I haven't been going utterly, utterly ballistic this game, but I would say generally what I'm looking for is about four to five hundred APM as a kind of average. By the end of the gameplay, like the whole playthrough, there should be about 20,000 key presses, something like that. So if it's a bit under that, then I have been more or less underperforming. So, now we're on the final fight of Chapter 8. And then we'll be moving on to the final character. And then there'll be one more repeat for Chapter 10, which I will explain when we come to that. So again, I'm just gathering up the Beowulfs. It also builds a little bit of ult for me, which is lovely. And there we go. And now I can deal with the androids. So... And that's that wave. And as long as there's Beowulfs, I'm always going to be doing this because it's the best way to deal with them and it's just free ultimate. And that is wave two done. What have we got for this? Okay. Very easy wave here. And then there's two mutated creeps. And then the final wave, what have we got? Just going to be dealing with these. And that was that, okay. Now Ren, I would say, is pretty two-dimensional compared to the other characters in the game. He's more or less just relying on his charged heavy and his ultimate to really do damage to stuff. And it's just a case of when to actually use those, where the combat really comes in. There's not really too much to him, unfortunately. Now we're going to play Jean. Now if you know anything about the show, you'll know that... Jean is kind of like the, let's, uh, let's just say he's not really a prowess when it comes to combat. But in this game, he's actually the second best character. And the reason being is, you might have guessed, he has a damage buff. Now the reason he's not as good as Nora, even though they both have damage buffs, is that Jean's is built into his ult. Like his ult is his damage buff, whereas Nora gets a damage buff for free and still has an ultimate. But it's kind of horses for courses. Sometimes Jean is better in certain situations compared to someone like Nora. See which wave we get. It's creeps, so I will not bother wasting an ult. And then there'll be two mutated creeps. And then that's that, okay. Three ults going into this section is actually quite a luxury, usually it's just one, but because we've got creeps on two waves, there was no real need to actually pop an ult. But we're popping one here just to deal with these bats a little bit quicker. Okay, and it should wear off here. There we go. Just deal with that, and then we just got to take care of the final enemies. It looks like we're getting mutated Beowulfs, which is all good. Okay, and then there'll be one more. I don't overly want to be wasting another ult on it. Yeah, no need. Okay. Yeah, you can get quite a lot of visual glitches in this game as well. <laughs> it 
totally not buggy. And let's see, what are we getting here? Is it creeps again? Oh my. Creep City, this level. Usually you get androids and all different sorts, but... I mean, creeps I'm not overly going to complain because it saves me ultimate, but I should be okay. I might have a little bit too much ult for this next part, but we'll see. But I suppose you can never have enough, right? But I may just overcap or end the level with one spare. We'll just see how it goes, because again, it's kind of RNG dependent. As long as double light heavy in groups is very, very good. Especially with Beowulfs, because just two of those attacks and it will deal with them. And it's also very good at building ult meter, so I'm full ult again. And that was that wave. And it creeps again. Okay. Bails. Something important to note about Jean's ultimate, because it knocks everything away from him, if you're surrounded by enemies and you use it, it's just going to knock everything away from you in like a donut shape. And that's not really ideal, so really what you want to be doing before you ult is jump away from things and then ultimates, they all get hit in the same direction. And that was that. Yeah, so I finished on one ultimate, so I was slightly overcapped, and that was due to all the creep waves we got, which can't really be helped. It's better to have too much than too little. Now what we're going to be doing for chapter 10 is I'm actually going to be playing Nora again, because she's the best character. But specifically, I'm choosing her so we can go for a strategy against the final boss, and if you know anything about this game, if you've ever played it before, you know how much of a pain the final boss actually is. But we're going to try and just deal with him as quickly as possible because no one wants to deal with it, right? So rather than spending, I don't know, like maybe three or four minutes trying to deal with it, we're going to try and deal with him in about 40 seconds. But the strategy is very, very inconsistent because it depends what the enemy actually wants to do. So it depends which attack the boss picks, it depends whereabouts the enemies are positioned and which one's going to attack me and which attack it chooses to use. It depends how fast the androids spawn in for the map. So it's really, really inconsistent because there's so many factors, but we like going for the risky play style. So that's what we're going to do. Now what I'm actually going to do, if it, if I get downed, I will go for the strat again. If the strat doesn't work and I don't get downed, I'm just going to carry on the boss as normal because there's no real reason to go for it again because we didn't get downed or anything. Just need to break these tanks and avoid getting blown up at the same time. Okay, and now we're heading to the final part. Now, Nora's talents, I actually go for pretty much all the defensive talents apart from improved aura regen because it doesn't inherently increase your survivability. But I've got a talent to increase the damage I can take after my aura is depleted and I increase my aura. And that's all specifically to be able to do this strategy on the boss so I can tank more hits and play very risky because that's how I like to play so there's just four waves to do before we can actually get to it doing with Nora is if you land directly on something with your well a Beowulf with your aerial heavy it should take it out with her damage buff 
But if you don't, it will always live on a slight sliver of health, like if you hit it at a slight distance. So what I'm doing, because I know the Beowulfs are going to survive, I'm countering the hop at the end and just firing a bullet, because then that will deal with it. Let's just deal with this uh, set here. Let's just do that. Almost there. Now I am going to be focusing quite hard on the boss because it does require a fair amount of focus to actually go for this quick kill. I mean again it's pretty like RNG dependent but we'll, we'll see how it goes so here we go. Bit of a hiccup but it's alright. Okay, all good. Wait for them to spawn, take them out. I missed one, which isn't great, but taken care of, so that's good. Now, this is usually where it gets a little bit RNG, but we'll see what happens. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, okay. So we got pretty fortunate there and everything kind of went my way. Sometimes the boss can do a different attack, which takes a little bit longer for its tail to come down, and if androids spawn in really fast, it can just mess the whole thing up. But we got fortunate there. I would say, as a kind of rough estimate, it works maybe like 75% of the time, so it's still worth going for. But anyway, time is going to be called as this airship comes in and the screen fades to black. And... time. So yeah, that was Ruby Grim Eclipse, all characters no skips. Hopefully I've been able to show all the different abilities and things you can actually do on the characters. It's a game that's often sort of rushed over, but I feel like it has a lot of potential to actually you know, if you have lots of energy and you like a game with a fast play style and you just generally love hack and slashes, it's one of the top games out there for that kind of thing. It just really needs the potential unlocking first, so... But yeah, that was Ruby Grim Eclipse, so hopefully you enjoyed, and thank you very much for watching. Take care.